Hi everyone, thank you for coming uh, to this talk about the university budget. It's a very important talk, which is part of Labor Week, uh, an interunion initiative, and the interunion is a broad-based coalition of labor and student unions on campus, and we put on a Labor Week and a conference tomorrow, um, and today is the beginnings of the conference, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Simon Trombetapin. Il complète une doctorat en sciences politiques à l'Université York, où il se concentre sur les liens entre l'économie et les structures démocratiques. Journaliste, militant et consultant en relations publiques, il s'est impliqué dans divers médias et organisations. Ses intérêts de recherche sont les systèmes politiques, les finances publiques et les perspectives de démocratisation économique. Simon Trombé-Tapin est un researcher avec l'UPIS, qui est l'Institut de recherche et d'information sociale économique, et un doctoral candidat à York University, où il travaille sur la relation entre l'économie and democratic structures. <coughs> Journalist, activist, and public relations consultant, he's involved in various media organizations. His research interests involve political systems, public finance, and the means by which we can dem democratize the economy. He has several publications with UBS, including Do We Really Need to Raise Tuition Fees? Eight Misleading Arguments for the Heights and a two-part series analyzing media responses to the tuition hikes between 2005 and 2010. Um, please uh, help me work. Well, thank you very much for receiving me. I didn't know it was part of a, you know, a, a broad effort in terms of the Labor Week and all that. I thank everyone who's organizing this to invite me here. Um, First, I want to apologize for the quality of my English. It's uh, certainly not my first language. Uh, and um, also for the quality of the presentation you will have today, you will all suffer from the Jim Flaherty disease. Uh, since uh, our federal finance minister uh, presented this budget yesterday, I was in the media lockup down in Ottawa. So I didn't have the time to update all the data I want to show you today. Um, so we'll mostly have data from 2009-2010 and not data from, from like 2011 like you can get on the internet right now but I didn't have the time to prepare that. Um, also you will have some tables that will be in French and some errors in my English in the written presentation. Um, so that being said we'll try to do something out of that. Um, I want to present you a few tables about but, uh, university budgets um, because there are a lot of myths. In fact, it's, it's, I'm extracting this data from the publication that was mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, eight uh, uh, misleading myth about uh, the tuition hike. Um, and I also added a few tables that I think interesting. Well, I, I will go through the presentation a bit quickly and after that, I think we can share and discuss about uh, the university budget. I'm far from being an expert and a specialist on the university budget. I knew I know a few things. I'm sure that there are people here knowing much more, even more about McGill that I don't know uh, at all in terms of details and how it functions and all that. We can exchange. I did the same presentation at Concordia University. We had a very uh, interesting ex exchange with. Uh, the vice, the vice vector, and I don't know what, uh, some, someone that takes care of money uh, at uh, McGill University. Uh, no, sorry, at Concordia. So it was really interesting. I hope we'll, we'll share some uh, interesting data uh, today. So first, well, let's take a look. I'll see if this works. Yes, it does. Okay, yeah. First, who is paying for university? Uh, now I can tell you a bit about 2011, but first let's start with uh, some historical data. Um, governments are paying 87% in 1988. Governments were paying 87% of university uh, costs uh, in Quebec. In the private sector at the time was paying for 7.5%, while the student 5.4%. 
what we can see from 1988 to 2009, and it would be worse in 2011, it is a raise of the, uh, the part of the share paid by the student to 12.2% and the private sector to 22%. So we have, uh, in 1991 and in 2007, raised the, some tuition hikes uh, that are happening in Quebec. So normally in the media sphere you hear, well, tuitions are freeze, you know, it's a tuition freeze in Quebec since like 20 or 30 years. That's not true. In 1991 till 1993, there was a major tuition hike in Quebec uh, uh, that more than double the, the fees at the time. And in 2007, nobody remembers that, so even if it's like uh, four or five years ago, but in, from 2007 to 2012, tuition fees were uh, raised by $100 per year uh, in Quebec for a total of $500 uh, rate, uh, total rates in Quebec. So what does that mean? It means that the share by student raised while uh, we have the growth also of the private sector investment in university. Uh, well, this is at the end of uh, the public sector, the government, that, are, that lowered their uh, participation in university financing by 21%. So, that's what happened until 2009. It is absolutely certain that in 2011, what I saw quickly before coming here, is that it's now at 63%, if I remember correctly, for the, um, for the government, and the students are around 13.5 or something like that. So the tendencies continue to uh, go this way. And with uh, what the summit uh, about uh, post-secondary education had as a result, so l'indexation des classes I think, how do you call that in English? Indexation. 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 Good. So, uh, with indexation, you, it's totally certain that it will continue to go that way. So that's that's sort of broad picture. Who's paying for uh, university? Let's see what university do with this money. Well, uh, university accounting uh, is functioning by funds. So there are mostly three big funds, but in fact there are like six or seven. But I'll I'll speak mostly about three. Uh, the most important fund, so, sorry, all that is in French because it was a picture and I didn't have the time to translate it. But this is the operation fund, operating fund. Uh, that's, this is the most important fund, as you can see it. It takes almost 60% of the university money. This is, this is the average for all Quebec. So it's not about Miguel, it's not about, you know, it's the average for all Quebec. So this operating uh, budget, that makes 60% of uh, the university budget is simply what is needed to uh, make the university uh, function. So you have, you have to pay for uh, teachers, you have also to pay for uh, people who take care of the university, uh, you have to pay for uh, you know, everything you need for the day-to-day -day functioning of the university. There are a few other funds, two major ones, Research and uh, donations. So research is allocated mostly for research activity. The definition of what a research activity is changed through the year. I'll come back to that. But normally, money you receive for research, mostly from uh, governmental funds or for private sector funds, uh, are, must be used for research only. That's, that's what you get, you know, when, when you're a uh, manager from a university, you get some money, let's say from a uh, shirt, and they tell you, well, this is for uh, this researcher that works on this particular project. You cannot spend it to, uh, you cannot use it to uh, pay the salary of, I don't know you, I don't know who, who's taking care of the building for you. So you, you need, Precisely to invest it in research. Uh, the nation, uh, sorry, I said the nation, it's not the nation, it's uh, building funds, infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure is uh, not for day to day care of 
uh, the infrastructure, but if you want to do major repairs or if you want to build new buildings, uh, so you, you need a fund for that. So that's, uh, that's the uh, infrastructure fund. There are others, as you see, donation, uh, some, you know, um, what do you call that, entreprises auxiliaires, you know, the businesses that are part of the university but are not exactly the university, like the cafeteria, you know, all those uh, small entreprises. Um, and some other not really important funds. So, what is interesting is that in Quebec, what, you know what the Quebec is saying? They could be saying we're missing money. When they say we are missing money in Quebec University, they're talking only about this fund here, the budget uh, opération, the operating fund. Fund. Why? Because they're saying that's that's what we need, you know, to uh, do uh, the teaching, to pay the professors, to do all. What they forget to tell us when they do that is that. In the building funds and in the research funds, we have much more money than all the other universities and the rest of them. Yes, for them, and the point of view of someone at the high level of a university, you cannot exchange money from a fund to another. But from a point of view of um, public policy, we could choose in Quebec to invest maybe a bit less in research and a bit more in uh, universities. Quebec is investing in research. The, the Quebec government is investing in research. And he is investing. Why? Because in the, the start of the 2000s, the Quebec herself asked the Quebec government to invest more in research. And now they're saying, well, we have, we have not enough money in this. But is there less money given to universities in Quebec compared to all other universities in total? We'll see that it's not the case. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Let's just go on. There, are another, there is another problem with um, uh, the building uh, fund. I don't know the situation in Miguel. I know it must be different because Miguel has a large uh, donation fund and I, I know it's using it to uh, for financing its building and all that. So I don't know exactly what is the situation here. What I know though is that the Ministry of Education in terms of the financing of buildings changed uh, its, its financing and reduced it from 1997 to 2007. I don't know what is the situation now. I don't have uh, recent numbers for that. But I know that in this period at the time where buildings were getting, uh, were, were needing major repairs, the government got out of the uh, building fund. So, the university were forced, in a way, to invest more of their budget, uh, of their total budget, into the building fund. So, there again, the government could have made other choices back in uh, 1997, or even before that, and invest more in buildings, so we wouldn't be in this situation uh, right now. If I go on about our university in Quebec under finance, that is the, the message you receive from Quebec normally, they're saying we receive less money from, uh, than from other uh, parts of Canada. Uh, well, you see, Quebec, if you take all the money that is given to university, money from students, from the private sector, from the government, if you take all that, you divide it by students, you receive, uh, in Quebec, it's about $30,000 per student. While you look at the average in Canada without Quebec, or with Quebec, you see that it's $28,000. So to say that we receive less money for universities in Quebec in total, is not true. No, simply in that it's true that we receive less money than Western Canada. And Alberta, they, mostly Alberta, put much more money in its university in terms of dollar per student. Uh, while for the rest of uh, the provinces, per student, we're giving more money to universities. What about our effort compared to our GDP? Quebec is 
more or less putting two percent, it's like 1.96 percent of its GDP in its universities. While the rest of Canada is putting a bit less than that. And now you see the difference with the Western provinces, is that since they have a very huge GDP, and in fact they're putting a much less, uh, a much smaller part of their GDP into universities. And so Quebec is already doing a major effort to finance its university, bigger than other provinces in Canada. And if you take a look at that, bigger than many other countries in the world. So compared to Australia, Canada, the, the average of the European Union and the OECD average, we're putting much more money into university than all those countries. So saying that we're not giving enough to university uh, is uh, maybe we should give more. Maybe we, we can say, well, yes, we're giving more than other countries, but that, that's not a problem. We should give even more to university. I have, in, in a way, I prefer that than giving money, I don't know, for military expenses, uh, personally. But is it, is it uh, because we are underfinancing universities that we should do that? No, it's not the case. We can do that, we can maybe fix some financing problem inside universities. That could be interesting. We can also maybe fix the way we're financing universities. Something that is less uh, known, and because it's uh, really complicated, it's the way we're sharing money between universities right now in Quebec. The way we're doing it is by a relatively complex formula, and I won't enter in the details of it, it's, uh, that is mostly based on the number of students in a university. That, that's a change. It changed in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, mostly under François Legault, who was uh, Minister of Education at the time. What the, the, formula, the, the formula does is that if you have more students in a university, you receive more money. That's the basics. But then you have a lot of other options that comes on top of this formula. That, there's a there's a rational for that. You know, you, there, there's something logical that if you have a lot of students, you receive a lot of money because you have a lot of uh, responsibilities for these, for these students. Problem is, because some kind of study co costs more money than other kinds of study, for example, if you take uh, the kind of, uh, if you take a look at health studies or uh, engineering, etc. So the ministry added a few bonus sector where you receive more money per student in those sectors. And if you're a university that is far from Montreal, that's, you know, a université en région, but the, the farther you are from Montreal, the, the more en région you are. Uh, so if you are in these uh, universities, you receive another bonus. And there are a few like this. But, that means that some universities receive no bonuses at all, or, or really less bonuses than others. Those, those universities, for example, Concordia University is one of them, because it has no you know, health sector, very developed, no uh, engineering, etc. Or, for example, HSC, surprisingly, receives a, le a bit less money than the other, and UCAM, obviously, uh, that uh, receives uh, less money than the other. That those uh, universities are not. Uh, how can I say that? Those universities would probably like to renegotiate this formula. In fact, when I was uh, at UCAM, it was also the, the, the it was always a question: Should we go back to the ministry and try to renegotiate? But the majority of the the other university think that if they go into another negotiation, they will lose in that negotiation, so they, they, they don't want to go into it. But maybe it would be time to reconsider uh, the agreement that we had back in the beginning of 2000, and say, for example, wouldn't it be necessary to have a bigger part of the financing that is by programs, to make sure that we're saving some specific programs 
even if they are not, if they do not receive a lot of students, uh, if we want to keep some disciplines alive in Quebec, and I'm thinking about very specific programs that have only one offerings in all Quebec, you know, there's only in one university that you have this specific program, maybe you want to keep it. But since there are, I don't know, 10 students per year that are taking it, oh well, we are not able to finance it, so maybe we should cut, cut, it, cut it, the case, because I was in the Board of Trustee of UCAM, I have a lot of UCAM example, but we have a dance, a dance program in UCAM that every year some people say, well, maybe we should close the master or the doctorate in dance because it's we're not making money out of it. But if you close it in UCAM, where where would those people go? Uh, so so there's maybe there it's time to reconsider a bit this formula, which has not been at all discussed during the spring crisis or even during the summit. I heard that there was a few discussion at certain level in the summit. But it was not at all the government interest to uh, renegotiate the formula of uh, the financing of universities. I'll just see what I have here. Oh, will will university receive money in the coming years? You know, th this is the liberal plan. You know, the, the, the plan that made the crisis and all that. That's what they were proposing when they, uh, in 2010, when they gave their budget uh, uh, when they presented their budget, they said, well, we'll increase tuition fees and we'll get 2002, 200 uh, millions out of that, in fact, almost 300 million. We will invest more money in university. That, everybody forgot about that. But the government was proposing also to put more money into universities at the time. Well, and they were hoping for a donation increase because they were giving more uh, tax credits and uh, some money from commercially oriented research. I, I won't talk about those two options here because it's not, the, the government is not responsible for those uh, for that money. But what is the country doing? They're, yes, they, they are making the indexation for the tuition fees, which says that those millions of dollars will not be there or there will be around like, I don't know, uh, 10, 50 million dollars per year, that's not much. But, are they suppressing this 400 million dollars? No, they're not. They're saying, since the beginning, we agree that we must put more money in university and we will put this 400 million dollars back into uh, university. So yes, university will even rec will receive even more money in the coming years because this plan, if the budget is accepted, if the government stays place, if if if, but the plan of the government right now is to put more money into universities. So it's we're not at all in a situation where universities are forgotten by the government, as we are hearing. In the, uh, in the media right now. So there will be more money. Yes, it's as usual with government plans, it's uh, small amounts in the beginning and much bigger amounts in the end because when the government is doing that, he's you know, pushing in front the big expenses and putting a bit of money in the, in the next year so he can, uh, can take the opportunity of the economic growth to pay for the next expenses, but still, they're, they are planning to invest more money uh, in university in the coming years. Maybe what I can do now is uh, exchange with you on those uh, various um, questions that I've raised, um, or maybe you have some questions about the data that we can go back to and uh, discuss, and then maybe have a, a more a broader discussion about what's happening with university budgets. Any questions? Yes? When you say the total government investment for the number of million, how does that tie into the 27 million we found out we just lost in the current budget? You, you mean in the current budget? Yeah, like we've yeah. all lost 20 million. So that sounds like that's this 430 million sounds it's, like we should have lost. It's, um, 
this form, this is what will come to university uh, in, on a yearly basis in the end of the pandemic. So in 2017-2018, that's, that's what that was the level. So right now what they're cutting because they want to reach uh, a balanced budget, etc. Et et um, I think you should you should reduce it from that cent, you know, more or less. So it would be four hundred uh, uh, millions and not uh, the, the four hundred thirty. But I, you know, there it's not exact. The government is not clear about that money right now because I heard the um, the education minister saying. Well, you know, with the growth of the economy, we could put back this money, it depends. You know, we hear a lot of things. I don't know, maybe some people here have, have heard clearer statement from the ministry on this one, but what I heard in the media, and that's, that's all I've got, is that, yeah, they're cutting it right now to reach a balanced budget, but they're not saying that this money shouldn't be in research or should it, shouldn't be there. They will put it back Someday, but I don't. Know, but it's it's not clear at all for me what what they're doing with this. So the board could do a lot less. A lot less. Yeah. Well, if they know what right now, what they're saying is they're putting that that uh, one. They're saying one point seven uh, billion dollar because they're calculating each year and making a big total and all that. I I personally I hate this way of calculating how governments spend money. You know they're. They're making yearly budgets, so why don't we talk about how many dollars you get every year, and not saying, well, if we calculate on a period of five years, we're putting that much money. That's exactly what's happening right now with the federal budgets, where they're saying, oh, well, we'll have that much money for the uh, uh, worker training uh, for five years. Yeah, but yearly, what does that mean? And so, so that's why I wanted to focus on that. I don't know how much it will be, but they, they still are saying that they will put this money into university. That at least at the sum, when they ended the summit, they were saying, we will invest this money. So, but as I say, I'm not responsible at all in terms of will they be elected, will they effectively do it or not, will they change their mind. I'll take some other questions. I saw one here. Oh, okay, yes. Go on. I've heard from the CSM institution that the promise has been made to the victories of the premium back $700 million. $700 million? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, I, I don't know what the rate is. Uh, I, I, I haven't heard about that. Uh, but it, it, that's a lot of money. If it's true, that's a very big amount of money. Uh, I, but I don't know what what were the, the secret discussions uh, with, with directors or any questions or maybe commentary or anything, comments, go on, insults, yes? I was wondering if you speak a little bit more about how that operational budget is, how, like, okay, so there's this huge operational budget, and we know it's about $1 billion, um, but, uh, as a huge lump sum, do you have any data as to how that's being proportioned? Uh, well, we have data, like like if you go to uh, the Association of uh, Administrative, uh, I don't know what's what's his, its name in English, but the uh, Canadian University, they have they, there is an association of all the administrative people, and they're collecting data every year, mm -hmm. and they're giving a very uh, interesting. Uh, a document about how it's uh, managed. Mostly operating budget is uh, payroll. Yeah. So you have like, it depends on the university, but it's, it's the big part of the budget. Um, and uh, what is interesting to see, I don't know if I, I don't have this graphic in this one, but uh, <laughs> you can normally what you see in Quebec in terms of how the payroll changed uh, during the year is that it's more and more, and more going to charge co and less and less going to um, uh, professor uh, uh, faculty members. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's one of the big change we saw. 
But um, you, and you can also see that the uh, the part to uh, given to uh, the other employees in the university is reducing because in many universities they have uh, outsourced some of their uh, some of their needs in terms of, for example, food or uh, food services or those kind of things. But uh, but that part is true is is more true in the rest of Canada than in Quebec. Okay. So does that include? That's an interesting yeah, well, in, in your case, the upper administration, the, the very top of your administration is taking quite a salary. Uh, but um, what we can see at least right now in the uh, in the, the big picture, I, I haven't checked in, in every university. Uh, is yes an increase in administration fees, but the, you know it's um, it's different from un one university to another. What I looked at is Université de Montréal, uh, which is obvious. Uh, I have another chart I could show you. I just have to get out of this. In terms of um, if you take a look at this chart here. Uh, this, what, yeah. um, that's from 2000 to 2008, but you can see uh, this is the um, uh, teach, uh, professors, and these are uh, the calm, uh, so administrative people and all that. You see that they're taking a bigger and bigger share at Université de Montréal. I wouldn't say if it's the case everywhere, but what is interesting is that we see that not only in post-secondary education, but we see that in, health, in the health system also. A lot of um, management people that take or bigger salaries, or we need more and more people. So we're uh, hiring more and more people. Uh, in the case of university, why, why do we need more people? Uh, in the case of university, we have a few hypotheses, but uh, you know, I don't have real data saying, well, it's for this specific reason. But it's certain that, for example, when you're trying to commercialize research, you need people to do it. You need people to uh, to sell your research to the private sector. To uh, you need uh, people to do the, um, all the judiciary aspect of it. You know, uh, and all that make some surveillance and uh, you know that costs money. In fact, one of our study in uh, 2010 was about how much money do we do in universities selling research to uh, uh, the private sector. And we saw that in Canada in one year, we made about $52 million in uh, selling uh, research to the private sector. So first, you know, the first uh, view you could have and Say well, well, at least it's you know it's more money for university. That's good, but the problem is it costs us in terms of uh, the people to uh, to take care of all this you know uh, commercialization of research. It costs the university about fifty million dollars. <laughs> so there's a two thousand uh, dollar profit, uh, two two million dollar profit, which means about. $1,600 per university. Uh, that's not a lot of money. Yes? In the case of McGill anyway, though, there's an overhead on every research grant received that goes specifically to cover the salaries of these people. So yes, it's like a 15, from research. 15 person or a 10 yeah. person for So an it's not coming out of their operating fund to, to have these commercialization officers and everything. So I'm not sure that that's part of your problem. That, that, that's interesting. I, I, I would agree, yes, that there are a part, we, we know it, there, there's a part when you receive money for research, there's a part for administration. Does it, does it cover everything? That's, that, that's I'm, so, I'm not sure about. Uh, but but it, 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 it's true that know. this exists. Yes. All around the topic, I know the deal of the Hired M1 employees by like 40% over four or five years. 
between 2003 and 2007, and those people get relatively good salary in the period. That, that adds up, that means a few million dollars of spending. And I have no clue what they're doing, I'm really curious if anyone knows why they hired so many people. That's why I'm to ask. <laughs> We, we all want to know. You, you, have, you have some ideas. <laughs> to reduce the, the membership of the Minaka units, <laughs> they're doing the same jobs as Minaka members. Their managers. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a whole class of there's people that we're um, contesting who are doing um, it's financial services, and they deal with grants, but grants that are bigger than the grants that Minaka people deal with. That's the only distinction. That's the dollar value of the grant that they process. So is that an increase in the budget? Like that, that's mean you're just adding more employees, just like in different whatever you're they're still the United the members. No, no, they're not. No, they're they, they're, they're, they're classified as managers. So there's been a reduction. But then they fire people and then hire no, people. No, there's been just a reduction in the number of when somebody goes or whatever okay. that job gets turned into a manager job. They hire one or they going to be funded, and then they hire managers to do it. Yes, at the back. Um, you started by talking about the projected budget that the Liberals were going to have in place for higher education through 2017 2018. Yes. I'm new, relatively new to this province, so my question is politically oriented. What is the general tendency of governments fulfilling those projections historically? Because I would like to believe that what they say they're going to do over a projected period of time will actually happen. But I'm I'm from the US and that, that just simply doesn't happen. Except for military budget That stuff they'll always throw money at that. You never have a question about a rate of uh, budget overall going up at least three percent per year. That's a different topic altogether, but my question is specific to Quebec governments being faithful to the projections that they use when they put the budgetary measures in place. Now, you know a, a government budget is a political government. You know it's yesterday we had a budget in the federal um, the government announced a big plan for infrastructure, uh, forty-seven billion dollars. Very good. If you take a close look in the three next years, so or in the in the coming year of this mandate, uh, in fact, the government is reducing the amount of money it's putting into infrastructure, but he's announcing at the same time much more money to come in twenty twenty after two elections. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, very difficult to say uh, how people are engaged. So that's one part of the story. But the other part is, we had a lot of difficulties in Quebec in the 90s uh, to say, yes, our budgets are reliable and all that. What we can see since about, about six, seven years, Projections from the Ministry of Finance, um, the, uh, the planning in terms of expenses, what we plan for two or three years in advance, we are almost at five or six person on what we were supposed to have in terms of income and to spend in terms of expenses. It, you know, uh, and Quebec received the price saying that its budget are more or less reliable Compared to other countries, it's it's better. That's 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 what the government tells. And for go, you know, going to a budget lockup since about six years now in Quebec, it's true that they're not very far from what they were telling us, you know, the year before and the year before this year. And it, but that doesn't mean they don't change their mind. They do. They do on some project. They do change their mind. And if they decide not to finance university next year, well, they decide not to. You know, they, they were elected, they're saying, well, we changed our mind. They, they can do that. And, and they do that all the time, you know, that's politics. Mm -hmm. so, 
So uh, I'm not, uh, I know that I'm not giving you a very satisfying answer, but that's that's what I, I ex that, yeah. that's what I've experienced. No, that's interesting. That's, uh, they actually have tried to hold on to the projection from the new Yeah, and in the last years, I think we can see. Although it's a minority document too, so that has to happen. Well, you know, in Quebec, we won't have any budget until. March 2004. No, we had one in November, so they will make an update now, and they will make an update next uh, fall, and then we'll have a real budget. Uh, so, so yes, the minority government is important, but they, there won't be big changes in the you know in the next uh, month to come. There, there will be a budget, and then we'll see if the government. Uh, will stay or will fall because budget must be approved by the National Assembly. So, you know, it's it's difficult to say if the minority government will uh, have a big impact or not on finances for, for the next month. Other questions, comments? Yes? Just going back to your tuition charts. So I'm yes. curious, uh, it was quite surprising to see that the rest of Canada puts in almost the same amount per student. Perfect. Why Why are their but tuition amounts so much higher? Because they're asking more from students and less from their governments. But the amount coming from the government was, was close to us. No, no, it's, it's the global, what I showed you, and I'll go back to this, I have it on this presentation too, so I'll go back to this. Uh, where is it? Here we go. This is the global expense per student on the university. So, what comes from the public sector, from the students, and from the government is all the money together. You divide it by, by the number of students, and you have this 29, 9.1 per student in Quebec. So, it's, you know, money is not coming from the, from the same sources. Uh, depending on the problem. But still, the amount, the total amount of money you have per university is this amount per student. And so, so we're not, you know, an exception in Canada in terms of financing on our university. And if we are, it's more on the high end, you know, we're giving a bit more money. You know, not $5,000 per student more, but a bit more money than the average. Yes? Yeah, earlier you said something about how the problem you may need to fix the problems of financing inside the university. Uh huh. Do you develop the government or do you see You know, I, I'm not. Um, I don't. I cannot tell you what we should do in university. I think that's university people that should fix that. But I think that, you know, this summit that we just had. Everybody was talking about consensus. I think we should get consensus out of that summit agenda. Maybe there's a way to get consensus if we sit and talk about how the distribution of money is there, and not exactly from what pocket does it come from. It always comes more or less from the same pocket. You know? If you're asking people to give money before they study or after they study, you're still asking, you know, the people of Quebec to pay for their university, and that's you know uh, that's the way it should be. We're paying, we're paying for the education system we have, but how we're you know sharing this money that we have, I think that this question would find a lot of common ground. We would find a lot of common ground between what students think and what. Most of the teachers, most most of the administration people think maybe the government would not agree on all because uh, but this particular government is not that much into uh, we should make their university the universities more efficient blah 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 which was the case in uh, 2000 they were a lot talking about that it's not exactly their discourse right now maybe we could talk about a new way of financing or sharing the resources we have. But I, I cannot, you know, uh, tell uh, 
uh, what university should do about that. People should meet and have a reflection about it. And I think if we would have done that during the summit, it would have been more profitable than saying, well, should we increase by $30 a year or $40 a year? Should we uh, you know, follow the inflation on uh, the general inflation or the inflation of salaries? Or, you know, this, this is not really a debate. This is just, you know, choosing for one number or another. And it's certain that if you ask the university, they'll say the bigger number because that's what they'll get. And the student, they'll say the, 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 the smaller number because that's what will get out of their pockets. So, you know, you put everyone in a situation where you won't reach any consensus or at least any agreement, not reaching that much more consensus, but an agreement would be good, let's say. Yes? Uh, people who don't work on how to find the efficiencies. In, Sorry. in the university, some people start looking at, like, the IRS or someone having looked at the budget and said, like, you guys can save money here, here, and propose it. Uh, I, uh, I remember, because I was on the board of trustees just after, uh, at UCAM, just after what happened at Udo Voyager, uh, which was a big financial disaster at UCAM. Uh, and we have people from the outside uh, telling us what to do with uh, the university money. Uh, it was more or less horrible what they proposed. Uh, well, they gave us a list of programs we should shut down. Mostly, that was the first thing they did. And it was what they called the orange list. And the first program was, as I was telling you, dance. But then, surprisingly, it was not, you know, human, I don't know, uh, sociology or I what, but um, uh, mathematic theory <laughs> and uh, uh, physical science. Wow. Because, because that costs a lot and there's not that much people uh, into those programs. So they were telling us you should shut those down. And, but, but, and so, so you know that all the uh, uh, preconceived ideas we have about where a university is losing its money, you know, in arts and I don't know what, though it's true that arts cost a lot uh, in terms of per student, it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, but so, so people from outside the university saying, uh, we will run you like a business and we'll show you how to run your business. Uh, not always a great, a great idea from my experience. So you, you need people that know what a university is for and that have a, a, a clear idea of what we're doing day to day in a university to say, well, okay, what could we do uh, and to, to reduce our uh, management fees, for example? Do we need you know, the rector salaries in average in Quebec raised in very important ways uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, about, in some university, it went from one to three. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite impressive. Um, do we need that? Do, do we need to give that kind of money? And do we need to put that kind of money into, for example, advertising to steal to the hotel, to other universities, because what's important is to get more and more students, because that's the way we'll get money, and we'll even open a new campus on a far, far away ground, <laughs> where we think we can have more students, you know, proposing programs that are already given by many universities. Not, you know, not improving our programs or anything, we're saying, and the example is UDN at Laval or uh, Sherbrooke at Longueuil. Bon, I can give you a list of you know those those. Uh, and what they're offering mostly, it's classes in manage in management because they know that's where the money is. Not expensive to offer and a lot of students to take it. So they're building university to respond to this demand. But do we? in terms of investing in knowledge, are we getting something from that? And, you know, the Quebec population and all that, are we learning more because we have a new management school down the social? I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I'm, I think we should rethink how we get money to university, but not that much how much. That I think the how is more important than the how much. 
and that's that, that's that's my point. Here. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, you you mentioned <coughs> the uh, the university putting a lot of money into trying to sell this into private. Yes. Um, Hoping to do some money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hoping to make money yeah. in some way in the future. That's um, uh, and, and that's primarily, I think, our experience here today. Like, there was this move towards organizing in a serious way. I mean, one of the, as you mentioned, the revenue salaries have gone up. But what's interesting is the argument that they made for that was that they should be paid the same salary as CEOs in the private sector. <coughs> People at other universities. So this is already documented, right? So, yeah, the, and, and it's a global market of um, managed right. by management right. and all right. that, and they're inside this global market, which in, in the case of many universities in Quebec is simply not true. Mm -hmm. Well, for what I know, Rob Denis was not, and maybe it's, it was a problem, you tell me, uh, Rob Denis was not in the eye management market in the rest of the world. He was the right. A professor had begun yeah. simply, and the same thing with almost all rectors at UDM, all rectors at Taiwan. They are not, you know, coming from I don't know where that we have to pay them based on. Otherwise, they'll go away. Well, <laughs> well, well, you know, will we lose Claude Corbeau because he will go to uh, I don't know Yale? <laughs> that, that's nonsense. You know, it's it's. I don't know in which market they think they are, but they're not, obviously. Uh, and maybe they think we want to attract new people, you know, from... But I, I just don't see them. I, I don't see those those faces coming from Princeton or I don't know where that are now governing our universities. It, it's just not the case. So we're giving more salaries to, in my opinion, people that would be there anyway. Yes. Uh, and. And, and mostly, you know, salaries for the rector were not uh, low in the beginning of the 2000s or in the 1990s. They were making much more than, you know, the average income in Quebec, for example. More or less than four times the average income. That's all right, you know. It's, n nobody's dying out of that. Um, but then they're making more or less eight times the average income. Is it that necessary? Do, do we need to put that in? And, and in the case of your record here, she's making what three times what our prime minister is. Yeah. Is, is. Is the function at the same level? Is, is this what we're saying? That a prime minister and a rector of a big university, it's the same thing? Or even the rector is more important? I, I don't get that. I don't understand what we're talking about. Or maybe, or maybe there's no market for prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this one would be quite a man, but that's another one. <laughs> but so yes, they, they, they are this, uh, this situation of the idea, but this idea of a global market is also true for students. And I'm certain that, uh, you know, we, we hear it a lot, and I'm certain that in McGill you hear it even more than in other universities in Quebec. But what, when you look at the percentages of students that are effectively, you know, magazine, you know, that they're looking at other universities from, you know, every places in the world, and, you know, that's a very, very small part of the student population. And that's like from, depending on the university, if you look at University Trois-Rivières or Lucac. Well, you know, must be like one person, if <laughs> ever. Uh, in Miguel, yeah, most probably that there are. It's evident. It's clear that there are more students that are, you know, looking to other universities and all. They have many big advantages coming to Quebec in terms of tuition fees. Well, that's that's for sure compared to the to uh, to United States. When for the rest of the world, you know, we're a bit higher than the OECD average in terms of tuition fees. Uh, you tell me, well, it's clear because there are so many OECD countries 
uh, that have free education, it's go, it's putting the average, you know, lower. But they still have free education, though. <laughs> so, so, so it's it's quite interesting also for a student going outside of his country to go, for example, at La Sorbonne, which is a good university, by the way, uh, that it, and with free education there. So you know, it's it's a strange idea this market this global market of education and it's even stranger to orient all our university for these reasons while it's for a very small proportion of our students when when universities were built to you know for the education of the population here and we're welcoming you know students from around the world but mostly for 90 to 95 percent of what we're doing, it's dedicating Quebec's population. And what, why why this doesn't matter is my so question. What, what, I mean, I, I don't mean to ask you to hypothesize too much, but why do you think that that is? Why do you think? I'll, I'll come back to that maybe in a conclusion. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I suppose. <coughs> Miguel is it interesting because. I don't know what the statistics are, but I feel like it's a much higher percentage of McGill students who don't stay in Quebec uh -huh. when they finish their studies. Um, and then um, somebody who works in alumni relations at one point was telling me that um, the growth area in, in donations right now for the university is um, the parents of current students who are from other countries, specifically China and the U.S., that's where they're getting, that's where they are finding more money. And I don't know, you know, in terms of percentages, if that's a large, I don't, I mean, I'm sure they get more money from, like, the Rothmans or whatever, but that's where they see that there's a growth. Um, but again, I don't know what like, what percentage of money or, or amount of money they're getting. It, it's certain that all, all, all what you're saying is true in terms of, uh, Miguel is an exception and is getting much more uh, student from abroad than the rest of the universities here. Much more student that made their study here will go away. But in terms of the overall student population in Quebec, the student that will study in Quebec and not work in Quebec and not pay taxes in Quebec and all that, are a very small proportion, a very uh, an exception. I don't know, Miguel, what this rate is. That would be very interesting to study, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure the rate is bigger in our heads than it is in reality. That that's at least in the, the, the proportion of students in Quebec. That is totally certain. When you do a debate about free education, every time and I did a few of them, uh, every time you do one, someone in the room will say, "Well, what will we do when students will go away?" Well, they're not. <laughs> that, you know, most of the students, they stay here and they pay taxes. So, so you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, ups, uh, there's this obsession about those, those students that will steal education and go away with it. Well, you know, for, for my point of view, education is good, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that people get educated in the end. So it's, it's not bad that if we're offering that to the world, I, I don't think we're losing something. But still, this, uh, this idea that we should protect that and all that, well, you know, if Quebec is a nice place to live in, if uh, there's a place, you know, you can uh, get a job, a job you like and all that, if we make this, uh, uh, this place a nice place to be, well, we can be sure that people who study here will want to stay here. That, that's the best bet we can do. That's to make this place uh, welcoming and interesting to live in. Uh, which, when we're saying to those people, well, ah, you're a stranger, you should pay more, you should end it. I'm not sure where that will come, but that's another mm -hmm. story. Yes? Is there any movement, uh, you think, uh, for universities to get together to rationalize the programs? Like, yeah. Well, there will be now the Conseil. Will be forced. <laughs> there will be now the Conseil des Universités. Well, there was such a thing back in the 90s, the Conseil des Universités, which is not the Quebec, 
Kibbutz is a place where a uh, rector meets yeah. and they, they're discussing and having a conseil, what, what I understand for, from what it will be, should be a place where they try to cooperate uh, about, for example, what they're offering in terms of programs, uh, how they uh, you know, share resources and all that. So there's this idea of what you're talking about in the proposal that got out of the summer. But before that, there is a shanti about this council. So there's a summit, and then you make a shanti, and then maybe someday you have a council. But what, how long all this will take, and what will come into the end of all that? You know, this is the this is the PQ mode of governance. <laughs> you 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 have you made a decision, but you don't want to tell me. So you put them in a summit. You take the decision you, you, you made before, and then you say, well, we'll talk about it again uh, on how to apply this decision, so we'll have some chancy. And then you go to the chancy, and then it's applied as the government wanted it to be applied, and then you have some result. Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which mode of governance I prefer. You know, the liberal mode of governance that is, we have an idea, we implement it, and we don't care about what you think. <laughs> or the other one that is pretending to have any interest in what you're thinking, but in fact that is doing exactly what they plan to do. But that's my uh, editorial point. <laughs> that's it, the rest was not. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry for having come late, I was not able to hear all of your presentation, but I was interested by your comments on the and perhaps I'll play the advocate. I did a degree at the Swan <laughs> It's true, I didn't pay very much, I just paid a registration fee, but it was, it was, I was shocked by the lack of services and the, um, the, the lack of support and the inavailability of staff and students when I was there. And when I was living in France, they, it's already clear that people who have the means, or, there's already a kind of cheap track in the business, yes. people who have the means, they go to uh, they go to, to Yes, they, go, they call Zika. And they, the families with needs will uh, sign up their, their children for special courses to help them get through the exams to get into these schools and the, uh, the universities, at least in the, uh, the bachelor and the undergraduate level, are so overcrowded that um, there's, it, it's basically a kind of, I, I was shocked it was a free for all in some ways, that um, it was up to the student, it was all from the no student support, so the dropout rate is horrendous. Yeah. And, um, I just, that was my personal experience and my experience living in France, it, it's, it's endemic in uh, the free university system and that uh, there's always kind of a lot of young people who are not even going to university, they're either trying to go for the policy code or they're going to kind of like special technical diplomas, uh, where they get technical skills to, uh, in order to start getting a job. And I guess one difference around between France and uh, North America is oh. that for any job there, you need to have some sort of diploma or degree. You just can't say, I know how to do secretarial work, so I can do it. <laughs> they won't hire you if you don't have the degree for secretarial work. So I'm wondering what you, you know, how do you, when people point to European countries like this, and you look at the reality, what, what are the arguments? How can we uh, take that all the inspiration and still argue for having a uh, free tuition? Like that? And well, it's uh, just to say that I am for this, but I, I can see that what people are saying. Um, it's totally uh, true that France has big, big problems with its university system. Um, problems of grands écoles, problems of basic école de commerce, uh, and a uh, division of its student population between bachelor degree sounds and all that and higher degrees that aren't there that you have, yes, meetings with your uh, director more often and all that. It, you know, there, there's uh, tons of problems uh, in France. Um, is France, France is far from the only uh, country with uh, free education. They made a choice, a strange choice, if you ask me, uh, saying we'll have, yes, uh, free education in the faculty, so you can go to university, uh, and anyone can go and 
that's all right. But still, there are these other real schools with real diplomas that give you real jobs, like uh, Lina, uh, etc. And then, and then those those schools are expensive and are difficult to get in. So they, they kind of build a, a, a elite kind of system out of the public system. That's a very, very strange, and if we were to build a system of free education in Quebec, I think we should look at France uh, to see how, how to not do a free education system. Um, it goes, it boils down to some basic questions. So the question of selection, um, how do you select your students? Is it open for everyone? Can everyone register and just go there and take a bath? Or do you make any selection? In Quebec, we're already doing some selection you know, for a lot of programs. Um, and sh should we do more? Should we do less? I think there's a part, part of responses there. For example, uh, Denmark, Finland, and all that. They're quite selective. Uh, they're, they have free education, but they're quite selective. Um, and nothing told us, like for example, in the South and uh, in South America, we have free education in many uh, countries, but they are so selective in terms of quotas. We will we will accept uh, 400 students, but not one more, even if it's if the person is really good. So that's a very strange way of looking. In, uh, in, uh, in other European countries. Uh, Germany, for example, but Germany is a complex system because it's divided by uh, their uh, regional uh, uh, governments. But anyway, there are more selections. Other question we can ask is, do we give the opportunity of uh, another system growing beside the public system? I think, for me, th this question is very important to understand France, and the answer must be no. It's like the, the healthcare system. If you build the private system at the side of it, you will take all the best parts uh, out of the public system and put them in the private system. For example, just to give you one example, we, give, we built in uh, Quebec a Medicare uh, entrance and have some, uh, some drugs for free, or at least theoretically for free. Uh, Anyone has an insurance for driving. But how does it work? If you have one with your employer, you don't have the public one. If you don't have one, you have the public one. What does it have as a result? Is that all the people that are poor in society because they don't have, or they don't have an employer at all, or they have four jobs where you don't have those kind of securities, are in the public sector, which is more and more expensive because those people are more um, have more health problems, so it costs them more and more. Uh, this year, I just made my tax report. It's about five hundred seventy-six dollars per year for drug insurance. So that's a lot of money if you're making twenty-five thousand dollars a year. So you know, it's it's this logic of building private sector services equivalent to what you're getting in the public sector. And losing money there, and losing good students, and losing a lot of you know good opportunities there. So I think that if we we want to build a more free educative system in Quebec, we have to look at what happened in other countries and select it with you know great care. And you see, we already have a part of us of our post secondary sector that is free. It's Cégep. It's, it's already free, but almost free. You know, it's, well, when I'm thinking about free education, I'm saying no fees ever, like not even $50 when you register, I don't know what. You know, If we had the same fees in the university and in the city, I don't think we would have had the, the spring 2012. So what I'm, I'm, think, what I'm thinking when I see CIGEP uh, is that we have there much more students than in any other uh, provinces in Canada. A lot of people are going to say that. We have there uh, a quality of education. I've, I've, I've given class in Ontario. 
with people that are coming out of uh, high school and I've given class in Quebec for people coming out of Sicha. You see a, a major difference between those two uh, type of people. You know, they are getting something out of that, uh, a way to learn how to do, you know, basic things about how to work on social sciences, obviously. Uh, uh, basic things to how to make, you know, produce a paper that is relevant and scientifically and all that. They learned it and they have the opportunity of trying different programs. That's what they're doing in Sita. Maybe we can say, okay, maybe we can uh, include Sita in our notion of free education in Quebec and see what would be the, the logical next step after CIGEP in terms of a free education system and try to see how we select people and which program don't we do not select people, you know, make those kind of decisions. But it's certain that France would not be, for, in my opinion, an example. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I'm really enjoying this. I'm learning a lot. I'm not really uh, academic, but I, I was just mm -hmm. trying to see when you're saying some of the good things that we are doing here in Quebec, and one of them is like, if I speak from my own experience, um, I graduated from a Quebec high school, went to work, and then thought maybe I'd like to further my education, and I, and I was able um, to, uh, to apply to a uh, Concordia, to a Quebec University, and do a few courses to prove my ability, and then go full time. And I was able to work, and I received loans and bursaries, and, uh, and I, got, I got an education, you know? And uh, I had to pay back some of the loan, but um, I think that's really cool. You know, I think that's accessibility. And I think it's happening, well, I'm older, but it happened like 20 years ago, but it's still, I think, I feel like it's still there, and I'm kind of proud to be coming back. And, yeah, I, and I think I think it's something we forget. Yeah. And, you know, we built the education system in Quebec to, um, in a situation where we were really uh, backward. Yeah. In terms From of the education. church, right? Yeah. Well, well you know, when we... When we built the education system, like the uh, diploma rate, uh, uh, enrollment rates in university, we were like uh, uh, 10 or 20 percent of what the other provinces were at the same time. And we're now at the same level, of them, a little bit less in terms of diploma, that's the, the burden of the past, but still like one or two percent differences. Uh, when you look at uh, enrollment rates, we're superior. <coughs> We, we got to this level. Why? Because we built university exactly like, like yourself for people who were already working and wanted to complete a diploma or you know, get more education. In the construction of the Quebec university system, this was really important, it was central. Why we built university in places where nobody would build, would build, a, would build a university? If you've ever been to Point on Hotel, you, you, you would not think that this, this is a university city. You know, and no one in Canada did that. Building universities, you know, out of nowhere in the north, and you know, and it was a very good idea to, to do that and to give the opportunities for these people living there not to be uh, not to have to come to Montreal or to Quebec City to go into traditional universities and uh, get long away from their family and stay there or, you know, have a, a, but live in their community and grow there and build a university that responds to what the, uh, the place is asking us. Because in the university, in uh, in ski, you have all this maritime institute that is working with oceanography and all those disciplines that are really linked to what people do there and what people do. Yeah. But still, you know, there, there are these links between our university system and the region was developed in. And, and this is a great thing about what we did. And when we're planning more and more to see university as places, and maybe I'll conclude with that and making a link to your question, uh, why are we doing that with university? Um, you know, when we're turning university, and do something that is needed for strictly for the economic development. We're getting 
first, we're, we're getting far away from this first idea we had. You know, Jacques Parizo recently said, when we built the education system, our ideal was free education. We, we, we were knowing that we could not get there now, but what we were planning to do is like any other developed country at the time, you know, uh, the United Kingdom University you know, was free, uh, most of European countries was free. So it was their model, model theory, and they were saying, well, we'll get there someday. But since we have to build like seven campuses in about 10 years, uh, maybe we'll need some money. So, so they, they uh, maintain the tuition that they already have and say, well, we'll get this money, and when everything is built, we'll start increasing. It never happened. Uh, it stayed uh, frozen. That was the, the compromis when we were working in the basis of compromis at the time. So that, that was the compromis. But then we started to think, well, our economic system is changing. We're not able to produce as much as we were producing before because other countries, with people that are paying, that receive less and less money, are producing much more rapidly than we are. And uh, we don't have any more infrastructure because it has been outsourced and uh, demobilized to other countries. So we, we should have something that we can sell. And like uh, the French are saying, on ne va pas pétrole, mais on a des idées. So we don't have it. We, we, we can sell those ideas. And what is producing ideas? Well, oh, universities. So we can use these universities as a factor of economic development. Well, this idea is exactly the opposite of what universities are for. Universities are there for the idea that you cannot make profit out of it. Because, you know, it's the only place where looking for the advancement of knowledge and science and arts and creativity for the sake of it, is for me. It's not, it's not in business that you can do that. You need, every hour you work, you need to uh, uh, have some profit to justify that you, you are working those hours. It, it's not, yes, there, there are some spaces because government is giving money, for example, to uh, people who are doing research outside of the university. It's true. But it, it's, minimal compared to what the university can do. And university is not only for research. We are supposed to transmit the, um, the heritage, the cultural and uh, scientific heritage coming from the past. And this has nothing to do with money. This has nothing to do with making some profit. We're, we're there because humanity needs that to remember where it, where it comes from and where it wants to go. That's that's the role of the university. And when we're turning that into, well, we need some high-end worker to work in our businesses, or we need some very good research that we can sell on the market and get some advantage against those other countries and all that, when we turn the university into that, we are, in fact, turning uh, the university into something that is not really needed because there are lots of businesses to do that, and that is contrary to what uh, we need as a humanity. Right? Thanks.